Hello and welcome to the edition of Chatting with Chatters on Footers TV. Uh, this is your host, Abhik Chatterjee. Today we've got an extremely, extremely special guest with us. Uh, he's the face you'll now be seeing whenever you tune in to watch the Premier League. He's John Dykes. He's back. And we are extremely happy to have him with us today. Welcome to the show, John. Hi, Chad. It's great to be chatting with you. Yep. So uh, this is an opportunity for us, John, first of all, to know how somebody like you, a presenter like you who's been uh, doing football for such a long time, how does the entire thing reach the viewers? So we'll be very happy to uh, quiz you about the entire process that's involved in a Premier League production, per se, and how it reaches the millions of viewers who tune in and watch the Barclays Premier League every week here. So let me start off straight away and let me just get the ball rolling. Uh, First of all, we would like to know what is uh, the production house that you're working for and what is it that it brings to the people who love and would, uh, you know, who tune into the Premier League every week here? All right, well, um, let's start with the big picture. Now, obviously, the Premier League is the world's uh, most watched league. In terms of yeah. a national league, we, we know for so many years now it's been tremendously popular around the world, but obviously the growth of TV coverage from the days when the Premier League first came into being to the situation we find ourselves in now is truly extraordinary. If you take a look at people who anywhere around the world watch Premier League action, you will find that there are 212 countries around the world who take the broadcasts. It goes into more than 800 million households. Now that's just households and that doesn't even account for out of home viewing. So you can get a sense of the, the kind of numbers that exist. Now when it comes to broadcasting the Premier League, obviously you have the primary product itself, which is the match action. Now let's say we call that our core content. The core content is the match coverage. And you add to that maybe one or two preview or review shows or Premier League World or something like that, then that is broadcast around the world to licensees. So broadcasters around the world, and in your part of the world, obviously it's um, uh, Star Sports, Star India, the, yep. the, 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 the licensee, um, they can take the match footage. Now, where things get a little bit more complicated, and this is, I think, where a lot of uh, your, your viewers are going to be really interested, is the way in which the studio stuff that you're seeing me do these days comes to you guys. Now, three years ago, the Premier League decided to launch what we call a content service, i.e. a service that provides content. Now, this content is in addition to what I just described as the core. Now, yep. the core content will be coverage of matches with commentary supplied, or not supplied, as the case may be, just natural sound maybe, plus one or two out of vision, i.e. no presenter shows. Three years ago, we decided, or the Premier League decided, to, to produce a content service. We don't even really have a name, and the reason why we don't really have a name, we're not necessarily called Premier League TV or the Premier League channel, is because we're made by an entity called Premier League Productions, and we're made as a kind of a, a template, if you will. We make programs 24-7 during the football season, only Premier League, of course, high definition, and we make it available to licensees around the world who, as well as taking the match coverage, also want to take a studio-based program. Now, that is very important because what that means is if you're a broadcaster anywhere around the world and you think that, well, I can put it out, say, for example, in my language, if you were in Thailand or if you were in another Asian country where predominantly the nation doesn't speak English, you might just take the match coverage and put the game out with Thai commentary and Thai studio presentation around it. Then, on another one of your channels, if you had a channel available, you might perhaps at a premium put our Premier League content service out there so that there's a 24-7 studio-driven English language content available. Now, you're entitled to call that what you will because it's your TV channel, but effectively you're putting the Premier League content onto it. Now, the Indian case is such that um, Star Sports have decided that uh, they will take, in particular, our match day coverage, studio based coverage that wraps around the games, and that's part of the offering that we put out, and they're putting it out in India. Now, 
I'm at this end, knowing that it's going to India. I'm obviously not at your end watching it on TV, so I'm not entirely sure how much you get or how much you don't get or, or, or what have you, but I'm delighted to say the feedback I've been getting, particularly on Twitter, has been unbelievable. But there's also a few um, misconceptions, because it's quite hand quite difficult, quite quite hard for a few people to understand this concept. Some people are saying to me, okay, well, so you're back working for, for Star or even for ESPN Star. Well, yep. my understanding is that, that within Asia, the corporate structure of that company has changed a little bit. Uh, around the other parts of Asia, it's uh, Fox. Fox Sports is, is the company yes. uh, that, that's now there. Within India, I understand the Star brand is still very much strong, and that's with, with whom I'm associated right now. What's funny as well is that when I came over to England to work here, a lot of people made the assumption that I was joining a British-based commercial broadcaster, that I was going to work for Sky TV or, or, or ITV or, for example, um, BT, which is the, the, the new big broadcaster over here. That's not the case. I don't work for a commercial broadcaster here. My services are made available to the Premier League Productions company, which is using me to work on our content service. So. Just to wrap up, what I do, as you see at the weekends and also perhaps on a Monday night or a Wednesday night if there's a game on, I go work in the studio, I anchor these shows. A couple of days a week, I also go in to our studios and I make a daily show because what we do is every day we do a two-hour show in which called Football Today in which we preview, review, we bring journalists onto the show, we have themed shows, we also have uh, preview material, we have news content, we have three at least news bulletins a day with a team of reporters all around England picking up stories for us. We have a very popular feature called Fan Zone, which is an international phone-in, Skype-in, email, Twitter-based show in which the viewers from around the world, very quickly after a game is finished or perhaps just during the day, can get in touch and talk to our presenters, talk to our experts, and also talk to each other via this program. So I'm part of this uh, very big uh, content pool of material which is available to broadcasters. So that's why you guys uh, are seeing this. Thank you, John, for uh, elucidating on uh, what exactly you're up to. For, for us viewers, when we when we look at you in the studio and we see the cool gadgets out there, the Telestrator and, and the heat map, mm. I just wanted to know how exactly, like, are these uh, are these software-based, um, um, you know, gizmos that you guys have there, or are these actual hardware pieces that are kept for the experts to go and, uh, you know, explain things to us on? Well, I mean, technology is coming on so very, very far. I, I've got to say that uh, you guys in India have come to the party at precisely the right time because... <laughs> You know, for the last three years, we've been putting out what we consider to be a, a very high-quality uh, broadcast. But this year, this season, we've really taken it to a new level. From my own point of view, I'm absolutely loving the studio. It's a new studio space. It's bigger, as you can see. We've got loads of room. We've got some fantastic camera angles. We've got a jib camera that's moving around all over the place. We've got what we now call uh, um, augmented reality. So when you see me making a piece of camera and you see Jose standing there or Alex Ferguson or whoever it may be, that's obviously a little bit of technology that augments onto a camera shot. Okay? So we can produce that and we can talk around it provided the camera shots work. Now, I'm no technical expert, but we're capable, I know, of generating those particular scenes as well. Now, in terms of the analysis that we're doing, we're accessing uh, Opta. Obviously, you know Opta and their statistical database. We're accessing that. So, for example, when you watched our build-up to Chelsea against Aston Villa and we were able to use the heat map, that is something that Opta makes available to, to, to clients such as ourselves. So we were able to show where Torres operated on the pitch in the game against Hull, as you saw, where Ben Teke operated on the pitch in the game against Arsenal. There's a wealth of material that we can tap into. Through the software that we have, we can then make that available either onto the touch screen or as well through our augmented reality. So it looks as if it's lying on the ground of the studio. Again, I'm no genius when it comes to the technology, but there's two sides to it. The touch screen itself is a, is a monster. It's, a, it's more than 100 inches. It's way bigger than the one we had last season. The touch screen physically is quite magnificent. And we have a, a fabulous graphics company called Delta Tray, which has come up with our programming, which basically enables us to use the touch screen. Now, this is something that evolves all the time. 
analysis and analytical tools in television are coming on all the way. We use an analysis tool called Piero, which is the one that Andy Townsend, Don Hutchison and the guys are using. And these guys are really cool with this. Now, as a TV presenter, one of the things that really amazes me is obviously I, I, I work live. Virtually all the programming that I, I do and always have done is live stuff. So I'm conscious of the, the need to, to keep calm and, and, and keep organized mentally whilst you're doing your show. So my job is very much just keeping things moving along. But what really impresses me is when I come to Andy, Andy's really our lead analyst, I suppose you'd have to say. And what Andy does is when a, when a half of football is being played, let's say a goal has been scored, he will ask our, our, our EVS or our video guys to send him to his machine the clip. He will then look at what happened and he, using his tools, so basically he'll have an iPad or a screen which he uses with a pen or his finger, what have you. He can actually run the video, he can run it backwards, forwards, he can isolate, he can freeze, he can telestrate, he can put boxes, squares, circles, lines, whatever it may be on there. He can put spotlights on and what he will do is as the half of football is going on, he'll look at this stuff or he'll pick up on a theme, where has um, Lukaku been running? What kind of a ball does he like play to him? And he'll ask the video guys to serve him up a selection of pieces. And then what he will do is he'll take that and he'll figure out how he can make his point best by using the tools that he's got. Now, this is where I get impressed because what we do is we don't pre-record that. We, there's no way you can. It's a live show. So we come back from our halftime break. I say, okay, Andy, let's have a look at that goal. And then live, live, he runs it. He runs it. He pauses it. He freezes it. He does what he wants to do with it. He talks over it. And obviously what we're then doing is we're cutting between our studio shots and going to the full picture, full frame of what he's doing. And, you know, that, that for me is, is as good as it gets TV-wise. You know, you're working live. You're making a point. You're using all the technology at your disposal. But you're still tapping into something that very few of us have, which is innate football knowledge. This is a guy who understands football through and through, a guy who's played at the top level, played at World Cups, using that knowledge in a way that hopefully will, will educate the, uh, the viewer and, and, and perhaps to a degree continue a conversation that the viewer might have started in their mind. You know, to tap into to a cricketing analogy, many, many years ago when I worked on cricket with the ESPN star, I was lucky enough to work with Richie Benno, the, the, the doyen of Australian commentators. Now, Richie Benno said something interesting once. He said, when I commentate, I'm mindful that what I'm trying to do is answer a question that's just beginning to form in the viewer's mind. So you can see where I'm going with that one, Chad. What I'm saying is that we look to be just keeping that sort of conversation moving along. So you're watching a game, part of you, because you know you guys are so sophisticated in your knowledge of football, you're aware that something's happening, there's something going on in this game. What we're trying to do is say to you, you know what, there is something happening, this is what's happening, this is why it's happening, and this is what may yet happen. So there you go. That, that in essence, is, I think, what we try and do with all of the knowledge, hardware, and software we've got. Not a lot of people uh, appreciate, John, how difficult it is to host a live show. Um, when you're doing previews and reviews, uh, at least have time to you know set up your script and prepare for it. But when you're preparing for a game live, when you've got so mm. less a time frame in which to set up your content, in which to form your questions, and in, in which to uh, you know basically cater to what the user exactly wants. Uh, even for somebody who's you know who's been working in this field for so many years now, uh, uh, does does it take that same amount of preparation? Does it does it do you always uh, you know practice and prepare? And does it take that same amount of effort that you you put in each and every time you're out there? Yeah, absolutely. The one thing you, you can never do is get lazy with this. You just can't rock up and say, okay, we're going to make a show right now. What, what goes into making a show is, is, is an awful lot, and so much goes on behind the scenes. You have, a, you have a producer overseeing exactly what the idea is. The producer plans, what are we doing today? What is our broadcast? How am I best going to make it happen using the presenters, using the guests, using the technology, using the on-site reporters, using the, the vision, whatever we have. Um, a director executes that vision, and then obviously the, those of us in front of the camera uh, are doing just that. Now, to do what I have to do, I think if I broke it down into the sort of component parts, you've got to have the knowledge. So I need to know my stuff. I need to know what's the game, what are we going to be talking about, what kind of knowledge do I need to have just up here or even at my fingertips. If you organize your notes or your whatever it may be, you know, we, we have statistical experts who are talking to me. So 
they'll chip in. Yeah, okay, that was the fourth time that um, uh, Ivanovic has scored against Villa, uh, more than he scored against any other club in the Premier League. That was with me within seconds of, of him scoring his goal. You know, how many times has um, Steven Taylor been sent off the minute he got sent off the other day? So, so, so I have stats guys in my ear, which helps when I need it. I have a producer in my ear because we have a structure, we have a running order as we way, the way we want the show to go but you know if a conversation is going in a really interesting direction a producer will get in my ear and say you know that thing we were going to do forget that this is so good let's just keep the chat going ask him this maybe let's go somewhere so it's a very organic thing you know the, the, the way we work and I think what you have to do is you have to rehearse as well I mean last week you know with a new studio with new equipment we, we were in every day you know you've got to get those those little things that we've started doing say for example in the old days when we went to a commercial break you've just watched a half of football the commentator wraps up tells you what the score is and what used to happen is we used to just come in and go all right thank you Martin Tyler and then in my ear I've got to count 10 seconds so 10 seconds to basically say thanks Martin what a great half of football that was when we come back Andy Townsend and Michael Owen will talk about it that's the way we used to do it now we come back into vision We've created perhaps a couple of those augmented reality shots. We've got a nice camera move coming in, and our video guys have cut something that tells the story of the half, which needs me to deliver some appropriate words over the top of it. So even a little piece of TV like that now requires a lot of work. So we were in last week before the season started, just making sure that we were all comfortable with getting all the component parts of that correctly together. And then it's just a question of delivering it on the night. So there's another question which I've been actually dying to ask you. I, I know exactly uh, what you were talking about when you said when the producer talks in your ear. Does it get distracting sometimes? Because sometimes uh, if, if, if you as a, as a football fan and, and if you want to talk about something and that is maybe not where your producer wants you to go, do you mm -hmm. stick to what the script demands or do you ad-lib it sometimes? You know, you just... Uh, you know, you, you go where your heart tells you to and then you tell your producer, you know, I think this was, you know, something which I felt would be good. Well, I mean, fortunately, I don't know what it is. Maybe I'm schizophrenic or something, but I, I'm quite comfortable with talking to one person and having another person talk in my ear. I, I think if I had to analyze it, maybe you compartmentalize the way that your brain works or something like that. But, it, but you're absolutely right. Let's say, for example, one of the guests says something interesting and I haven't picked up on it and I try and move the conversation in a different direction. There's every chance my producer's going to be screaming my ear saying, what are you doing? Where are you going? You know, go back. Oh, it's gone. You know, so, so it's hilarious. Sometimes, you know, you might be having a conversation while somebody's yelling at you, but fortunately that doesn't happen too often. Instead, what I like about it is I like the fact that that sometimes, I, I, I don't know if you've seen the movie The Truman Show, but yeah. I'm not repeating the words coming from, from the Ed Harris character, character, from the director, but you are almost having a conversation that involves a guy who's sitting in a room, you know, 20 meters away uh, with, a, with a headset on. So, so that's when it's really quite cool because those guys can bring a lot to it. They, you know, they, they can help me shape questions and things like that. And I think from my own personal perspective, the key to a great broadcast, I wouldn't be anything without a great guy really just pushing me, just, just, just being, producing me, getting the questions away and, and guiding the broadcast. So that's how I think it, it works best. Have you ever, uh, have you ever faced uh, a, a sort of uh, situation, John, wherein something has gone wrong with your teleprompter and, and you've been required to, you know, ad lib and has, has something major ever gone wrong for you in a studio which you've been able to handle smoothly? Yeah, well, first things first, I don't use a teleprompter. So, I, honestly, I, it's because uh, one of the reasons why that happens is because I effectively evolved as a TV presenter working uh, with ESPN Star predominantly on live programming, but also working in an environment where we produced so much programming. You know, I, I, when I first worked at ESPN Star, I might work in the morning on Formula One. I might have a rugby game in the evening, and then late night I might have a, a football game to cover. So there was such a huge volume of, of work to be done that actually sitting and writing down detailed scripts and then putting them onto a prompter was, was logistically quite difficult. But also because of the nature of live sport, apart from the, the moments at the top of a show where you're building up to a game and you kind of know what the content is, you've got a 
an interview you recorded that week with somebody, maybe you've got a feature story that you've cut. Those times I will actually write a script in terms of the words that will go into that. But I still, just because it's my habit, I tend to memorize that rather than put it on something to read. Because I personally believe, and, and, and I've occasionally I've done shows where it's required a teleprompter, I feel that, that I don't deliver lines as naturally if I'm reading them as I would if I'm just saying them. Now, obviously, it requires you to be able to make sure you, you, you get you get the memorizing correct and you deliver it correctly and what have you. But the other thing as well is if your teleprompter was to break down in a live setup, and I see it happen with other guys, they're suddenly floundering because it's tough. Where, where do I go now? What do I do? Whereas because I'm doing mine ad-libbed, then it's natural. And, oh, yeah, things go wrong all the time. The most catastrophic things go wrong. You know, we, we lose pictures. We do this. We do that. But... If you can just seamlessly carry it on as if that was the plan, then nobody knows any better. What I always say to my colleagues is this. We have what I call a running order, the way it's supposed to happen. The audience doesn't. The audience gets what the audience gets. And if we can make it look as if that was the way we planned it all along, then there you go. Has there ever been a situation where, John, you've said, uh, we're now going for a break and, and the camera is still on you and you haven't gone for a break yet? <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, that can happen. Um, you've got to be really careful. You know what you've got to do? You've got to train yourself not to swear in a TV studio. The reason being, and people who know me know that, particularly if I'm on a sports field or somewhere, I, I might occasionally do so, but the reason being that whenever there's a microphone around, and you could be, you know, you, you could be even not on air. You might be just wandering around the studio. Somebody somewhere might hear something. So you kind of have to get into that, that habit. Uh, I've seen some hilarious things over the years. Fortunately, this one didn't happen to me, but I remember when I was growing up, I lived in Hong Kong, and one of the broadcasters was, was covering the Olympics there, and they had a couple of presenters who were very new and very inexperienced, and they had a studio that was brand new, and it, it kept falling apart. You know, you could see things falling off. And the funniest thing I ever saw was they went to a commercial break, they came back from a break, but nobody told the presenters that they were back from a break. But also, nobody told the technical crew that they were back from a break. So this guy walked onto the set, kneeled down, and started fixing something with a screwdriver on the desk. The presenter, who I think was reading his notes, suddenly looked up at the off-air monitor and realized, oh, my goodness, we're, we're on TV. We're on right now. And he got his hand on top of this guy's head and it kind of sort of shoved him under the desk and said, hello, welcome back. And, you know, that, that made me realize that, that, you know, anything can happen. Since you're a big uh, football fan, John, how does it feel to be, you know, going in every day to work? Because you're dealing with football right now. You're analyzing it. You're interacting mm -hmm. with the people who've played the game. And you're bringing the game to so many people. So what does the football fan in you feel? Like, how, how, how does it feel about the, the job which you're doing? Well, there's nothing better, really nothing better, because, you know, a bit like, you know, yourselves, we, we talk football naturally. If, if I wasn't working in football, I'd be watching it. Ask my, ask my poor, long-suffering wife. Now, thanks to technology and, and our ability to, to kind of record stuff and, and play forward through matches, she doesn't have quite as big a problem. But one of the things that, that I do is, is I have to record a lot of football. You know, if, if there's been Champions League action and La Liga action, if I'm keeping an eye on players from Italy or Germany or what have you, you know, I need a lot of stuff. I need to watch football. So, so I very often will do a, you know, an 11 or 12 hour shift uh, of football uh, of work and then I'll come back and I'll sit down and watch some football, uh, which doesn't always go down that well with the wife and, and daughters. But, you know, it, it, it's what we do and I try and try and balance things out. But to answer your question, yeah, it's 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 the dream job really because you see, you know, I love the game, I watch the game, and to be able to be engaged in it, and I'm not just talking about working with the ex players, although that's wonderful, but behind the scenes, there's an entire staff. If if you could say, you can imagine it, the kind of guys, the kind of, of, of people who work in our production office are all people who love football, and every day you walk in there and guys are buzzing about what's happened, what is happening. They've been off doing interviews, or, or, or they're about to do interviews, or we've got some new technology and that helps us do some analysis, or we're all you know, looking at each other's fantasy teams or whatever it may be. So it's a pure football environment. And, and that's wonderful because what that does is it means that everybody kind of speaks the same language. You know, you're all, you're all reading from the same book to a degree, which means that when we do sit down to try and make a show that, that, that replicates stuff, it's very easy for everyone to get what we're trying to do. Who are the best, uh, you know, uh, 
ex footballers that you work with John I know you work with a lot but whom do you think stimulates your intellect the most and whom do you think brings the most to the table in terms of uh, what the user is trying to understand well I think the key to that is is again coming back to the overall production of our broadcast you've got to make sure that you put the right people on the right jobs, on the right shows, in the right context. You could have, you know, you could have the most famous footballer in the world, but if he's not particularly good at talking, then you're going to have a problem. Similarly, you might have the best analyst in the world, but if he's not that famous, then you have to gauge, you know, where, where the, the level of the audience is. I'd like to think that, that we've got a team that represents pretty much everything that we need covered. The constants in terms of our broadcast, as you'll discover through the season, Andy Townsend is, a, is our sort of tactical uh, analyst. And, and he is, as I said earlier on, he is, is simply superb. Um, the guy has an ability on air, live, unflappable, to, to just deliver a point so well, so graphically, that it's, 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 it's a pleasure for me to, to learn from the guy. So, so Andy's fantastic. Alan Kerbishley has been a really big find for us, and it's funny, you know, there are still people over here in England who keep going, oh, Alan Kerbishley's looking for a job. I can tell you here and now, he loves what he does with us, because Alan's got so much experience from managing in the Premier League with Charlton and with West Ham, that he has encountered just about every situation that exists. So on a Sunday afternoon, especially when the weekend's coming towards its end and we're trying to draw some conclusions, I like turning to Alan, because he puts things into context, he puts things into perspective. Now, when it comes to let's say, the more high-profile ex-players, then this Saturday, for example, we've got an Arsenal game. And, you know, who knows what's going to happen with Arsenal. They have a terrible result last week, a great result in Europe. Now they've got Fulham, which is a tough game. Who better than Tony Adams? Now, Tony's going to be in the studio with us. And Tony's great fun because Tony just says it as he sees it. He's just raw and he's just full on and what have you. Uh, Roy Keane has been with us for some games. And Roy is, as you'd imagine, as sharp as entirely brutally honest as you'd expect him to be and when we've covered United games especially with Roy you know he doesn't mince his words, doesn't pull his punches uh, Michael Owen's been a great find, Michael is now adjusting to life in the media Michael is wonderfully enthusiastic, he's learning all there is to know about TV about commentating, about being in the studio and last night he was able to talk about the strikers art, how to finish nicely the pressures that come with being at a club like Real Madrid the Spanish character, just 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 why it is that, that, that someone like Juan Mata is, is, is working so well with Chelsea. So, you know, we like to think that we can tap into the right guys at the right time. We've also got people who are really forging careers for themselves. Don Hutchison's a good example. Now, if you look back at Don's career, Don actually, you know, a goal scorer for Scotland against England, you know, Liverpool, Everton, you know, Sunderland, West Ham. He has a, a degree of knowledge that, 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 that we tap into wherever possible. He's able to give us, he knows Michael Carrick very well. He always gives us a good line on, on Michael. We've worked with Gareth Southgate a lot. Gareth is very good with young players, with England. You know, there's a, a bit of a crisis of, of where do we go with, with young English football right now. Gareth is very eloquent when it comes to talking about things like that. We have a whole team. We, during the season, you'll see that we'll be rolling out, you know, from Andy Cole to Deep Mahaman to whoever we think might be the right person for the occasion. We'll just keep, you know, the good guests coming. The one thing which I can tell you about the people who've played FIFA is the moment you hear Andy Townsend talking, your head goes straight to Clive Telsley and Andy Townsend commentating while you play mm -hmm. FIFA. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. And yeah. the thing is, John, that this season is, I think, it, it represents one of the most exciting seasons we will be having in some time now because the, the, all the top clubs have had managerial changes. Yeah. You've ha you, have, you have an aura about this Premier League which is, which is so unpredictable. Uh, wherein you'll have at least four to five teams, I feel, challenging for the title. So it must be potentially very exciting for you as a presenter and as a production how to be acting Premier League this time. I, I think, um, honestly speaking, um, even before the end of last season, once we, once we knew that Sir Alex was finally stepping down and therefore there was going to become, there was going to be managerial change there, Chelsea, and Manchester City, by the end of the season, we knew that, that something special was going to be coming along. Now, even beyond that, with what Spurs have done in the transfer market, I mean, wow, the, the, the way they've gone about their business, that suddenly, you know, I understand. Now, we're, we're sitting here talking at a time when the Gareth Bale deal looks like it, it is 
kind of going to be happening in Spain sometime in the next day or so. So they've, they've gone and they've taken an approach to dealing with that that has been to really get after some amazing players. I mean, Soldado didn't get much of a kick during the game the other day, but he scores with the penalty. And Soldado is, is going to be a 20-goal a season striker, just what they need. You look at the quality they've brought in elsewhere in that team and look as if they're still bringing in, and it's, it's unbelievable. They, while I don't know if they'll win the title, they're going to be a huge factor in it. You know, they've already they already know how to go to Manchester United and win. So, so you know, they're going to be there. I like what I saw from Liverpool. I like the way that Brendan's getting that team to progress. And 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 I think if they are able to land a kind of a powerful midfield player, I think they've got enough of those neat, cute little players knocking around. Get themselves a good, powerful midfielder cover themselves a little bit more in the central defensive positions, and, you know, they're going to be a match for anybody on their day. Arsenal, we know they need to buy. Uh, we know also that, that you can, can't discount them, that they're going to be there or thereabouts. So I genuinely think that we're looking at, I think we're looking at maybe six, maybe six teams who will directly impact that title race. Now, I think that this kind of sparring between... United City and Chelsea has been fascinating as well. Yes, United strikers went out and, and, and did the business last weekend, but I think it's clear that, that, that they, they probably will be looking to a midfielder if they possibly can as well. City looked to have bought really well, but the company injuries demonstrated they probably need a, a world-class centre-half as well, I think. Plus, uh, who's going to be their striker? I think that'll resolve itself, so, so they're fine. Chelsea, boy, all they could possibly want across the centre of that midfield, I think they're pretty well covered in most regards, but the striker. It looks to me as if Lukaku is the one they should give a chance, but I don't think Jose would want to go into this season knowing he's got such a great chance of winning the title and thinking to himself, but maybe, maybe I should have gone and bought a striker. So I think there's every chance you'll see some movement in that respect. You know, it's, even by my high expectations of pre-season, I think this is this is kind of exceeded it. The way we're shaping up right now, I think we're in for a stunning season. Another question which I wanted to ask you, John, is about what your take is on Daniel Levy, the Spurs uh, chairman, because he's somebody who you know people don't give a lot of credit for the uh, you know the, the 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 kind of progress that Spurs have made over the last few seasons mm -hmm. because he, for everything that AVB does. There's a part that uh, you know Levy plays in it as well because they, I think they're the, they're the team that have conducted their transfer business the most smartly in the transfer window, and the yeah. the kind of hardball he plays when he does sell, we 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 had a look at it when Modric was sold to Real Madrid, and now we're having a look at it like, the amount of money he tries to squeeze out when he sells his star players. So what do you think? How what do you think goes on inside the head of somebody like Daniel Levy as as the chairman of Spurs? Well, you're right to talk about him, but there's one key uh, ingredient, I suppose, that, that we need to talk about, and that's um, Franco Baldini, who has now come in, and he effectively is, is operating in this director of football role. Now, Baldini has come in from Roma, and previously, of course, he was working with, with Capello with the England setup. He is the single most important change that's happened at Spurs in recent seasons. You're absolutely right to say that Daniel Levy has been a, a very hard-nosed businessman, and ultimately he, he has the last say, and he, he, he seems to be able to, to really maximize the financial value of what he does. But it's no coincidence that most people said, ah, oh, the bail situation is going to absolutely kill them because, you know, Daniel Levy will do his deals late, Spurs will be in limbo. Instead, quite the opposite. They have all summer long and are continuing to do business. You know, great targeting, great acquisitions, possibly great value. I don't know. I don't know how the prices are going to work out in terms of performances. But Andre Villas Boas, and this is the key, if you look back at the most successful clubs in terms of acquisitions, it's always occurred when you've had a, a kind of a symbiotic relationship between the, the, the head coach or manager and the person upstairs making the decisions, whether it was Arsene Wenger and David Dean identifying players and bringing them in, or more likely Sranix Ferguson and, a, and his chairman being able to do it. Andre Villas-Boas is very, very close with Baldini. In fact, Baldini wanted AVB perhaps to go to Roma. That hasn't happened. It's gone the other way. Now, AVB will be very comfortable, because it was the way he operated at Porto, very comfortable by being the head coach 
and not being the man who insists on having the final say on transfer dealings. Instead, he will be guided by Baldini. Levy will, of course, with Joe Lewis's money, be making the big decisions in terms of exactly what the numbers are going to be. But that's a neat little team that's operating. Now, contrast that with Arsenal, where there's an America-based guy who handles most of their negotiations, but ultimately it'll come back to the manager. And Arsene Wenger's got a lot on his plate. So for him to have to make the final call on, 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 on transfer dealings, I think that's one of the reasons why they've got themselves into this difficult situation. Perhaps if they had someone like Baldini working for them, as Spurs do, it, it, it would go a bit better. Another interesting thing that uh, we want to talk about, uh, John, is, is the situation as Man at Manchester United. It's not only about... Uh, it's not only about, they are the Premier League champions, no doubt about it. Manchester United went ahead, they won the Premier League quite comfortably last season and with Ferguson stepping down, he himself has identified Moyes to take over. But if you look at how Manchester United as a team have been progressing in Europe over the past few seasons and if you look at how Manchester United as a team have, has performed over, let's say, the past five years, ever since Carlos Curos left, the, the, the guys he bought in when Carlos Quiroz was there at Manchester United, he bought in Anderson, he bought in Ronaldo, and the guys whom he bought in laid the foundation for Manchester United's success in the next two or three seasons, and Manchester United went on to win the Champions League and feature mm. in another two finals. But mm. ever since he's gone, uh, the kind of players that Manchester United buy, if, if, you look at the, if you look at the team makeup, you'll find less skillful players, but more efficient players. You, you might have a very efficient Carrick operating in midfield. You might have your Ryan Giggs. Paul Scholes obviously was a legend in his own uh, in his own way. But if you look at the skillful players like the Ronaldos and 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 and, and the Nani's, hmm. they have either gone. Ronaldo's gone to Madrid. Nani is you know he's been very very uh, erratic and therefore. But the addition to the side, leaving aside Zaha, there haven't been many skillful players who've been added. And therefore, their uh, progression in Europe, per se, has gone down, if you, if you look at their progression in Europe. So, do you think Manchester United needs to relook the entire way in which they play football? Uh, because at a time, yeah. they had Tevez, Ronaldo, Rooney in the same team with Berbatov. And that was a fearsome team. So, do you think they need to yeah. relook? Yeah, maybe. I, I think, you know... There appeared to be a time in which people were all trying to follow the Barcelona model, but I think you have to be true to your, to your football identity. I mean, okay, listen, they have got Kagawa there, and, and admittedly they're still trying to figure out how, how best to use him, but he's a tremendously skillful player. He, he, he would fit into, I think, a, a kind of modern German-style team where you have great athleticism, dynam dynamism, and then just someone with that little touch to link things up. Um, I think they are a very much a work in progress right now. You, you're right to mention Zaha, who I think has tremendous potential. You'd probably argue that, yes, Nani didn't fulfill his potential. And perhaps last season, the likes of Young and Valencia didn't contribute as much as they might have done in the past. But I think that it would be perhaps foolhardy for them to go down the route of saying, well, we're going to put together a tiki-taka team or something like that. Because there are others who will do it and possibly do it better. United's core strength has always been the ability particularly to get crosses in, um, and, and last season they led the league in goals from crosses once again. Throughout the history of the Premier League, they've predominantly been good at that. They, 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 they have got a strength to belief, and I think they have a, a, a powerful style of football that they should never want to compromise on, particularly counter-attacking football. Uh, Van Persie, in Van Persie, they have the best striker in the league. The numbers simply back you up on that. So I don't think there's too much that needs fixing there. For years, we've been. Uh, Carrick is obviously a tremendous footballer uh, and an influential footballer. For years, we've been talking about the need for a, a powerful central midfielder. And again, I think that's what we come back to. If there is that dynamic, powerful player out there who's also got that world class ability to, to, to maybe go and grab a goal for you as well, boy, how many of them exist? You know, if you can get your hands on somebody like that, maybe a Schweinsteiger or someone like that, then you're talking. But how many of those players exist? Uh, I, I think that United. Uh, have to have to figure out what they're going to be under Moyes. Um, his acquisitions, if he makes any, will give us a, a very strong idea as to what they're going to be. But you you will never discount them. You you should never discount them. And and, and they'll be up there fighting for the title as ever this season. Another thing, John, uh, which is very interesting to see is that over the past few years, if you look at the average age of the managers in the Premier League, it is 
the managers are getting younger. You've got somebody as young as you know Andre Villas Boas uh, at uh, Tottenham. You've got uh, you've got Martinez now at Everton. All these managers are pretty young. So there was a saying in a time wherein football managers needed to be ex players. They needed to have a whole lot of experience. So what do you think is the reason for the average age of managers, you know, going down? And you have all these young dynamos like Andre Villas Boas coming in and influencing the Premier League. And other well, leagues, per se. The, yeah, I mean, there's, there's two things to it. Firstly, uh, unfortunately, uh, it's a product of the short life expectancy. You know, the, the, there was a time when a manager would stay in a job for, for a long, long time, five, ten, maybe even more years. And as a result, they're going to get older and they'll drag up the average age of the league. But for one reason or another, that, that just doesn't happen these days. When you consider that Alan Pardew is the third longest serving manager in terms of at his current club, in the league, then that, that tells you an awful lot about where we are right now. Um, yes, uh, the younger managers have come into the game, but it's a question of whether they get fast-tracked into the really big jobs like this. That appears to be the case more and more these days. Um, but, you know, Brendan Rodgers has been managing a long time. You know, even, even AVP has been around for a relatively long amount of time. But I think what is happening is because the older managers are no longer quite as secure in their jobs, you know, a bad season or two and, and they're gone, it's almost natural that there'll be a younger person coming in to, to take that one's job. So I think it's it's more a product of, of, of the shorter term nature of the job than it is of anything else. Now, what used to happen in Serie A, for example, was there were short term jobs and the older guys, you know, the Zednek, Zeman and, 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 and Ericsson and guys like that, they just went from club to club you know, or Lippy, uh, doing two years here, two years there, two years there. That's one way of doing it. I think what's happening over here, uh, in England especially, is that there are the shorter term jobs coming up, but it's just a younger breed of manager that's coming in and doing that job. If you look at the Premier League, uh, John, by, by just by the style of football they play and by the effectiveness, and if you judge how good the Premier League is based on how many teams progress in the later stages in the Champions League and how many teams from the Premier League go on to win the Champions League. Mm. The Premier League no doubt is very entertaining. It is the most entertaining league in the world. But if you look at the, the quality of football that they play, do you think that it is being the Premier League now has fallen behind in terms of football played by maybe in the, in the Bundesliga? Because if you, if you watch the Bundesliga and if you watch teams like Dortmund play, uh, mm you would be very, very, you know, you, you, can, you cannot but be impressed by the amount of pressing that they do, by, by, the, by the quality of football that they play and by the amount of talented players that they have. So do you think the Premier League in terms of football, as in quality of football, is just falling slightly behind the Bundesliga and maybe the La Liga to some extent? No, no, not at all. Um, I take your point about individual teams <clears throat> and that's the mistake that a lot of people make. They will say, oh, okay, it's falling behind the Bundesliga. But, but you look at the Bundesliga, Bayern Munich are, are, are all-powerful and dominant. Yes, Dortmund play great football and have played great football for a number of seasons, and that's been reflected in Europe, and, and I, I absolutely love watching them uh, play there. But, but look below that, look below that, and, and there's no way you're going to say that the Bundesliga uh, is, is consistently producing a better standard of football than the Premier League. Similarly with La Liga, there's such a discrepancy between the big two and possibly one or two clubs beneath them. But, but lower down the league, yes, there's a different type of football, maybe a more uh, skill-based kind of football. But how do you quantify these things? You've done it quite rightly by saying progression in the Champions League. And it's a matter of fact that, yes, over the last couple of seasons, you'd argue that... Uh, you know, but for Chelsea winning it, the overall uh, performance of the traditional powerful English clubs has not been as good. But I tell you what, Manchester City had the most horrendous draw in the last two seasons in the Champions League. And I fully expect, if they get even slightly better draw this time around, that they will be a major force in that league this season. Chelsea, uh, you've just got to look at what they're going to do in the Champions League. Yeah. yeah. On, on potential. Manchester United will be there, of course, and now Arsenal look as if they've got themselves there once again. I think you're going to see, um, based on what I've said about the, the, the potential for this league season in England, with the quality of the players to be one of the best ever, I think you're going to see the English dominance, not dominance, but competitiveness in the Champions League returning. Germany has happened to produce two sensational outfits in, in Bayern and, and, and Dortmund in the last couple of seasons. 
congratulations. That's why they're so powerful. Real Madrid and Barcelona continue to be able to buy the best players in the world. So, of course, they will be there as well. But I think, by and large, you're going to see a much greater impact on the Champions League by the Premier League clubs this year. Now, if I, t if I make it a very interesting situation, John, this is, this is debate we keep on having amongst friends, is that definitely the Premier League is the most physical league by, by far out of all the leagues in terms of the amount of the, the work rate that goes into it, the end-to-end -end stuff that goes into it. If, if you take Messi, for example, you take him out of the Barcelona system, and this is a discussion that we have often, and you and you pit him against, you you maybe put him in a team like Arsenal, which has you know which resembles Barcelona the closest in terms of the mm -hmm. style of football that they play by passing, and and you pit him against the physical teams like Stoke and Hull and Everton. Do you think somebody like Messi can go on and score 90 goals a season in the Premier League without the aid of you know uh, Iniesta and Xavi in, in a more physical league per se? I think Messi would be absolutely brilliant wherever he plays because he is simply a genius. Um, and actually, you know, people use this argument against who you play against. Well, if a referee um, applies the rules properly, you shouldn't have a problem with who you play against. It's probably more pertinent, as you said, to talk about who you play with. Yes, he is absolutely blessed to have such sublime players around him, helping him realize his best of his talents. But, you know, if you put Messi into Arsenal, uh, but perhaps more appropriately with respect to Arsenal. If you put Messi into uh, Manchester United, Chelsea or Manchester City right now, oh yeah, you'd, you'd be seeing the same performances and possibly the same numbers, I think. But then again, it would come down to the quality of the defensive opposition, which I suppose in recent times, defences haven't always been on top, have they? So yeah, I, I think it'd still function as well. And if we move away from the Premier League, John, and if we look at the if you look at UK as a whole, if you look at the, if you look at England as a footballing nation, uh, England as a footballing nation is at this moment way, way behind than some of the like. You, you look at Spain, you look at Brazil. They're, they're leagues ahead of England right now, despite having one of the best leagues in the world. Why is England? I would not say failing, but why isn't it able to get up there and fight with the best? Would you? You have the best players. You've got Rooney in your squad. You've got Gerrard. You've got Lampard. You've got the best players in there. So, where do you think England is lacking in terms of, you know, footballing quality when it comes to such nations? Uh, well, I mean, to start with, I, I, I'm not particularly well qualified to talk about about England in terms of. There's so many aspects to it. Um, as someone who, who watches the England team play, obviously the England team is capable of, of getting results against the very best. Just 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 look to the occasional recent results. It, it, it's possible, of course. Um, you might argue that perhaps we don't have the best players in the world anymore because some of the players you mentioned either uh, are coming towards the end of their careers or perhaps they haven't quite uh, replicated their club form on the international stage for whatever reason. So there's a certain limitation in that respect. The other thing that would be a concern is the recent performances, for example, of the under-21s. So, so, so if you contrast that with, with Spain, for example, then there's obviously not the same quality of, of player coming through there. However, um, you do have a situation whereby um, for certain tournaments, maybe the under-21s, they haven't always been able to select their best players for, for whatever reason. So I don't think that England's results and performances there have always been representative of the true strength uh, in terms of the quality of, of players available. Um, it would be good to see more high-quality English players playing in the league. There is perhaps a little bit of a, a, a myth. Um, Last season, 37% of the players that played in the Premier League were qualified for England, as opposed to uh, 47 who are in Germany, uh, in the Bundesliga, who were qualified to play for Germany. But the difference is that perhaps the players who were England qualified weren't as good as the German players who were Germany qualified, if you see what I mean. So it would seem, and the Premier League's working very hard to do this with the clubs, to... Um, improve the quality of the players, the homegrown players that they're developing. And I think you'll start to see the, the, the results and the rewards of this in the next two, three seasons. You're going to see a stronger core of English players coming through. So what it means at the international level, firstly, England need to qualify for a World Cup. That's not a gimme, by the way, right now. But if they do so, it's going to be interesting to see quite what kind of an approach they take there. Would it be a question of saying, look, you know, maybe we use the next tournament or two major tournaments to, to just really try and build 
uh, that would be interesting because from what I can see, there are one or two talented young players out there, uh, and maybe the model would be get some of these young players playing Champions League football on a regular basis, get them battle-hardened in that respect, and then see if that translates into success for England. The, the, the Spanish, for example, take a very different approach. They tend to keep players in the national structure for a very long time. Um, there's a lad called Jose Campaña, who I think is at Crystal Palace, who, who um, actually has captained um, Spain's under-20s and has been part of two successful under-19 European Championship winning teams. They seem to build a core of players who progress through you know, the various age groups and then naturally progress into the uh, national team. I think we've seen the Dutch and the Belgians do that as well. That, for whatever reason, maybe it's the power of the clubs in England, doesn't seem to happen uh, at England level. Um, so if, 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 that, if that doesn't change structurally, then as I said, maybe it's incumbent on the clubs to develop their talent, make sure they get their English players out in the first team, make them play competitive Premier League and Champions League football, and see if that's how England benefits. Now I'm going to ask you for a prediction, and I'm not going to ask you the same boring question, predict who's going to win the Premier League, predict who's <laughs> going to be the top scorer. I'm going to ask Good. you a very interesting question. Out of the current crop of managers that you see, leave aside Sir Alex Ferguson and leave aside the Jose Mourinho's who've established themselves as legends in their own right. Out of the young managers and out of the upcoming managers, whom do you think has the potential to be termed as a legend? Mm, legend. Well, legend, I guess, will be defined by sustained high-level success, which means to become a legend, they would need to move up to a, a really top job. So, Villas Boas is interesting to me in that he has had a had a look at Chelsea, so he might not get another look again. But if he was to do something spectacular with Tottenham, to win something with Tottenham, then either Spurs themselves, who've got great ambition, could 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 drive him on, or he could even get a, a, an even bigger job off the back of that. I think Paul Lambert appears to me to be somebody who is capable of doing maybe what David Moyes did a few years ago, get a lot out of not very much. Now, if he continues on his trajectory, particularly given his playing pedigree, yeah, he might find himself uh, becoming somebody who's pretty special. Um, of the others... Uh, well, oh, yeah, Rogers is worth looking at. Rogers appears to be taking a club in a very defined direction. Again, it will be determined by success. It's all very good, you know, showing progress and playing nice football. We've got to win stuff to be a legend. So at the moment, those three, I guess, look as if they're in a position where they, they, they may be able to do something. Our final question towards the end of the show is like, us at Footers, we look up to people like you and, 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 and you know, we, we know how passionate you are about your job and even we feel the same way. So what would your advice to, you know, people like us be and, and what do you think, uh, you know, should be our main aim and objective so that even we can do and make a change in, you know, in our own small way in, uh, related to football media and, and get our views and opinions out to people. So what would your advice to us be? Okay. Uh, I mean, firstly, congratulations on, on doing all that you're doing. I think it's wonderful um, that, that, that you have a voice. And, you know, I, I spent many years um, sitting in my office at ESPN Star in, in Singapore, reading emails from, from Indian football fans. And what was interesting to me was that a lot of people tended to, to stereotype the Indian sports fan as, as, as being a cricket lover. And obviously that is true because, because they and we are all, you know, cricket lovers. It's a wonderful sport and, and India plays a huge role in it. But I was always conscious that there was more than just uh, a small core of football fans. And I'm not just talking about Calcutta and, and Goa. I was conscious that across the nation there was a predominantly young, extremely sophisticated um, football fan that, that, that was, was watching football, European football, and had an opinion and was, was educated. So I like to think when we were working that, that, that we weren't pandering in any way, that we weren't patronizing, that we were just having a, you know, a, a discussion which you guys are taking on. Now, I think don't fight against cricket, don't rebel, don't say it's football versus cricket, just, just you know, learn from, 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 from the success of that sport and think to yourself, well, if we can get football to kind of weave its way into the public consciousness in the same way that cricket has to, to any extent, 
and I can see that happening. Look at MS Dhoni being involved in the, the, the Star Sports campaign. Look at the fact that whenever the Indian cricket team goes out to play, they kick a football around. You know, the guys, the guys love their football. They're, they're kind of speaking football's kind of talk these days. You can tell they watch an awful lot of it. I think what happens is it's a, it's a, it's a kind of common movement. The, the public gets into football. You guys are there offering, you know, uh, your, your insight, your opinion, shaping things, moving with the trends. Hopefully on the pitch and at an administrative level, the game takes off. So I think it's no one single thing, and, and you as, as the media and the broadcast media, you have your part to play in it as well. So, so I think it's a movement really, you know, Chatters. Fascinating to have you with us, John, and I, th I think uh, it's one of the rare moments when you are on the other side of the table and, and, and you've got somebody else asking you questions, but it was lovely to know your thoughts and uh, I, I think it is going to be a very insightful show and people will know more about the man who brings the Premier League. To them. We look forward to the rest of this season. We look forward to seeing you all the very best. And we do hope that you will continue to support us in your own small way and we can maybe catch up again sometime soon. Absolutely. It's an absolute pleasure and all the very best with all you're doing, Chad. It's good to talk to you. So that was it. Uh, John Dykes, as insightful as ever, as crisp as ever, with all his thoughts. Uh, until next time, we'll be having somebody else, uh, somebody special who will be sharing their views and opinions with us. I hope you did enjoy the show. And you can uh, always write in to us at footyloose at the rate deed hyphen inc.com. Till then, the Premier League is in. The other leagues are rolling. Make sure you watch your football. Make sure you discuss, you talk about it. Have a good day and keep watching.